hope the building isn't struck by lightning because I'm here all uh, <coughs> hooked up electronically. That might uh, not be well. I always appreciate an opportunity to uh, stand while everyone else sits so that I can look at people eye to eye. <coughs> and uh, so I hope everyone can see me. Um, if not, uh, please just raise your hand and I'll try to stand on my tiptoes. Um, well, today is not simply the first full day of this conference. It's also October the 1st, the first full day of our nation's fiscal year. Our country begins today with a fresh budget, as people no doubt know. That's what a fiscal year is about. A clean slate, a new plan that seeks to match our fiscal blueprint with our social and economic needs. At least that's how it's supposed to happen, right? So we know from many years past, including the current one, that we do not, here on uh, October 1st, have a uh, fiscal blueprint for fiscal year 2011. But anyway, on paper, that's what's supposed to happen. Nevertheless, today is a good day, to, uh, as any day, but certainly maybe better than most, to commit or recommit ourselves to view our government and economy with fresh eyes and an inquisitive mind. When it comes to economic matters, this includes not simply looking differently at our federal budget policies or looking differently at our tax policies, but also looking differently at our federal monetary policies. For probably everyone in this room, this makes absolutely perfect sense. Budget, tax, and monetary policies go hand in hand. Understanding our nation's policies and economy are directly Limit linked. Seeing the connections between wars and the power, or lack thereof, to directly create or control money by we the people are a given. But that's not true, as we well know, for the majority of people in this country. Monetary issues are foreign, alien, cosmic, on the same level of familiarity as understanding the nebulas of the universe, so it seems. What exactly is money? How is it created? What purposes does it serve? Who controls the monetary spigot? And how does it profoundly impact virtually every other element of our economy, nation, and in fact, world? If aware of monetary issues at all, these are questions that people ask, are they not? That's how it was for me. I'm relatively new to this field. I never learned about monetary issues in school never heard or read about it in the mainstream, quote unquote, news, never debated whether or how to organize around it. In the 25 years that I've been involved in social uh, education, uh, advocacy, and organizing for a change. But then I discovered it. I read, and I read some more, including the lost science of money, twice. I organized others to study and discuss. I helped uh, organize Steve Zarlenga to come to my part of the world in Northeast Ohio to conduct a workshop. And we organized then delegations to meet with uh, our two aides to our two US senators and aides to our three area US representatives. We didn't need to meet with Dennis Kucinich since he's uh, pretty much already on board. And we encouraged them to read, to study, to reflect, and of course to co-sponsor the American Monetary Act. We've shown and continue to show the film Money as Debt. But it's only the beginning. We're all only at the start of what needs to happen to bring fundamental change, to democratize our society, in fact, to democratize our money. That's our quest, is it not? Part of what needs to be, I believe, our life's work. It all begins at the beginning with study and research rigorous study. The lost science of money is certainly, maybe in this field anyway, the single best example on monetary issues of rigorous study and research. Rigor being the operative word. It means taking the time to widely, deeply, exactly, and precisely examine a topic. It's what I learned from those who launched the organization I'm connected with today called the Program on Corporations, Law, and Democracy, POCLAD, which nearly 20 years ago 
began as a group of, we call ourselves, frustrated activists who were tired of constantly reacting and responding to one corporate assault at a time and decided to step back and examine the state of social change organizing. Poclad investigates and instigates democratic conversations and actions that contest the authority of business corporations to rule, to govern. Their analysis evolves through historical and legal research, writing, public speaking, and working with organizations to develop new strategies that assert people's rights over propertied interests. Poclad began focused on historical and legal research and study, rigorous research and study on the nature of the corporate form. It was the first organized group to deeply examine the issue of corporate rights. And what they discovered was that the American Revolution was waged not simply against the King of England and his army, but against the King's crown corporations, like the Massachusetts Bay Company, the Carolina Company, the Virginia Company, the Baltimore Company, and others, who had the power given by the King of England to rule, to govern. Corporate charters were democratic institutions used following the revolution by the colonists to define and not regulate corporate actions. Legislatures and courts controlled by both Democrats and Republicans, as Poclad learned through their rigorous research and study, dissolved corporations that acted in ways not defined in their charters or licenses. The ability of business corporations today to do what they want, where they want, whenever they want, was never intended, we found out, by our nation's founders. Corporate behavior is not a given. It's not like gravity or some other law of physics. It can be changed. Poclad injected the concept of corporate personhood into our culture. They cautioned against the distractions of spending too much time reacting to this or that boycott, pleading with corporate executives to sign voluntary codes of conduct, or working legislatively to slightly reduce the amount of, say, poisons permitted in our air or water. Changing constitutional and legal governing rules was more important than changing political faces, political parties, or slight laws regulating corporate harms. The right to decide and the right to rule by human persons were the crux. The Bill of Rights, Poclad believed and still believes, was and is intended for people, not corporations, which are no more than a bunch of legal documents. As it dug deeper and reflected on what it learned, Poclad realized the core issue was not corporate power, but our lack of power, our relative disempowerment. It was about overcoming the, what we call, colonization of our minds. That is, that our history and culture has limited what we consider possible, practical, and achievable. Gaining and proclaiming real self-governance should be our ultimate quest. Finally, Poclad believed that rigorous study and research on this issue was the single most important action that needed to be taken. We looked at study and research, not just simply as study and research, but as an action, given the lack of understanding of these issues, including among social change activists. Helping activists, in fact, reframe strategies and campaigns to address core causes could only happen until corporate constitutional rights and how they came to be was dissolved. Poclad produced a definitive work called Define Corporations, Defining Democracy. It's a hardback book, yellow in fact, very much like the lost science of money uh, in the sense of it was sort of the definitive initial definition, laying out both uh, intellectually as well as providing some ideas of what could be done. So it's an equivalent of sorts to the lost science of money. Poclad has since, like uh, the American Monetary Institute, 
produced other resources. Uh, it's produced a newsletter called By What Authority? And it's held, like what Stephen has done, gone around the country, uh, led workshops on the issue. In the case of Polk Led, called uh, Rethinking the Corporation, Rethinking uh, Democracy.